everyone. My name is Kelly Hall and I'm a marketing coordinator for ALS North America. I want to thank you all for joining us today for our Webinar Wednesday series. Our presenter today is Paul Pope. Paul received his dual bachelor's of science degrees in chemistry and molecular cell biology from Texas Lutheran University in 1995. Then he completed his master's of science in physical and analytical chemistry from the University of Utah in 1998. During his time in college, Paul served as a teaching assistant for the chemistry department until 1997. After graduation, he was introduced into the industrial hygiene and environmental field as both a certified microscopist and an analytical chemist. Paul has worked as a senior project manager with ALS Environmental for over 20 years within the industrial hygiene division. Now he is an ALS project manager for IH and works closely with clients to help develop sampling strategies for both routine and non-routine analytical chemistry projects. Today, Paul will be discussing crystalline silica sampling using current OSHA guidelines. During this presentation, feel free to use your chat box, ask a question, or raise your hand features to ask questions. All of our questions will be answered at the end of Paul's presentation. Paul, thank you for taking the time to deliver this presentation today. I will go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everybody, for attending. My name is Paul Pope, Project Manager for ALS Environmental based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. And today we'll be uh, talking about uh, crystalline silica. We're going to go into a little bit about the uh, chemistry, its uh, many uses, uh, touch briefly on the regulations on that, and get heavily into the actual sampling uh, protocols for that, as well as the technologies available uh, for capturing the restful dust. But before we dive into all that good stuff, I just want to take a brief moment to kind of talk a little bit about ALS Global, especially for those that are new to our company. Uh, we've been around since uh, early 80s. Uh, we are an inter international uh, analytical services laboratory that uh, offers, serves actually a variety of different industries. We have a presence in over 65 countries and employ approximately 13,000 people worldwide. In uh, North America alone, we maintain 49 sites. Uh, 24 of those are actual lab sites uh, that serve different industries, while the remaining uh, sites are actual uh, service centers that are strategically placed throughout the uh, different time zones. Our international corporate headquarters is actually based out of uh, Houston, Texas. Some of the industries that we uh, currently serve involved, uh, especially in the U.S., the environmental testing arena for soil and water. We also offer industrial hygiene air analysis. Uh, we get into quite a bit of the uh, oil and gas uh, and minerals, including geochemistry, oil and gas, metallurgy, uh, even get into food and safety and quality testing. Uh, we have some divisions that uh, function as uh, pharmaceutical analytical laboratories, as well as nutraceutical. And we even offer uh, consumer product testing capabilities as well. To kind of give you a, an idea of what kind of level of experience most of our laboratories have in their respective industries, um, our Salt Lake City laboratory has been around for over 45 years in operation. Uh, over 30 of those years was as the primary NIOSH contract laboratory in which we had a hand in developing a variety of not published NIOSH methods, including those for currently used for pesticides, metals, uh, diesel particulate, and most recently, uh, environmental illicit drug testing. Uh, we are a full service environmental industrial hygiene laboratory. And with respect to our industrial hygiene have been uh, accredited under the uh, American Industrial Hygiene Association or AIHA uh, steadily since 1974. Over the course of that time, we've actually uh, brought online hundreds of different methodologies and analyzed uh, thousands of different uh, compounds. Uh, but today we're going to be focusing on our crystalline silica capabilities. So what is uh, crystalline silica? What do, you know, we hear that term quite a bit. If we look at the general uh, abundance of the uh, periodic charts and the elements on the periodic charts with respect to the uh, Earth's crust, um, you'll find that oxygen is makes up approximately 47% of the overall abundance. The next uh, most abundant element is actually silicon. These two can actually combine to form silicon dioxide, which is the basic building block of the uh, crystalline silica lattice. Now with crystalline silica, there's actually quite a number of different uh, polymorphs of that version, but from an industrial standpoint, we tend to focus on three of them primarily. Uh, the most abundant one is our alpha quartz, commonly known as quartz. It's typically found in soil, sand, granite, and as an impurity, impurity in a variety of different minerals. 
about 98% of the time when you're doing your monitoring, this is going to be the primary uh, polymorph of interest. Relative to the three polymorphs, cristobalite is the second most abundant one. Uh, typically, this tends to favor more high temperature and or pressure type conditions. Um, it can be find, found in some uh, naturally occurring in some volcanic rock. Um, but from an industrial standpoint, you might expect to run into this in, say, a foundry type of application. The least common of the three is uh, tritomite. Uh, this one is typically, uh, there are a few mines in the world that uh, produce this, but uh, we rarely see this uh, uh, coming in from an industrial standpoint. Uh, silica's got a very important role in our uh, use of everyday items. Uh, We've been using it since as early as 3000 BC during ancient Egypt engineering. But today we use it uh, not only in just our general infrastructure or construction, uh, but it's actually mixed in quite a number of uh, everyday uh, items, including abrasive rubber. Mainly the uh, tire industry uses that quite a bit. That uh, offers a lot, some of the rigidity and, and strength to the tires, as well as gives us a little bit of friction. Uh, paper, plastics, wood fillers, a lot of health and beauty. And as you know, uh, the semiconductor industry uses it heavily, uh, thus the name Silicon Valley. Uh, it's also used quite a bit in solar panels, which is uh, important because uh, although it's not the most efficient in converting uh, light to energy, it is the most abundant and helps bring down the cost uh, for that type of technology. Where would you might expect to uh, run into uh, monitoring for crystal and silica? Typically, anything that involves generating dust that, that contains any one of these polymorphs. Uh, the concrete masonry construction or demolition uh, uh, industries, a lot of sand blasting, rock drilling, which includes quite a bit of the uh, uh, fracking uh, industry, earthworks, rock crushing, road construction, maintenance, repairs. Uh, the mining industry has been uh, dealing with silica for us you know, well before we got into it uh, over the last 40 years. Uh, but they're regulated under the uh, mining industry or the uh, MSHA, uh, and the current OSHA regulations do not apply to the mining industry. So we're talking about the uh, OSHA regulations. Uh, when OSHA looks at silica, they're talking in terms of all three polymers. So when you're submitting samples to a laboratory and ask for silica, by default, we're going to automatically run for all three forms, quartz, crystal, white, and tritomite, unless specified earlier or different. Um, occasionally, you might run into something called amorphous silica. This is basically just glass. Um, if we were to run amorphous silica using our crystalline methodologies, it would basically be invisible. So what we'd have to do this uh, to uh, get this converted uh, over, we have to basically heat this up under a, a platinum catalyst and convert it over to crystallite, the crystalline form, and then we analyze for that indirectly. But from uh, current OSHA regulations, the crystalline silica uh, regulations does not apply to the amorphous silica. That's got its own uh, regulations, which tends to be um, higher permissible exposure limits. Historically, we've been using uh, the old formula, which is basically a sliding scale. Uh, the higher the percent silica, the lower the occupational exposure limit. So typically, for the last 46 years, we've uh, uh, had the laboratories receive the cassettes. We analyze for both restful dust and then uh, do the silica on the same cassette and provide the client with a percent silica content. They would then have to basically take that percent silica, plug it into the equation, and calculate their own permissible exposure limit. So basically, the higher the silica content, uh, the lower the uh, restable dust value that they'd had to adhere to. Fast forward to a few years ago, and OSHA decided to get away from the uh, scaling factor. And regardless of the percent silica content in the materials, uh, has provided a, a more conservative uh, time-weighted average recommendation. So today, we're following a uh, 50 microgram per cubic meter. So anything that's uh, at or above 50 micrograms per cubic meter over an eight to 10 hour work shift uh, would be considered exceeding the uh, recommended permissible exposure limit. In addition to the uh, time weighted average, uh, we have an action level of 25 micrograms per sample or uh, per cubic meter. So uh, if you're exceeding either one of these levels, basically that initiates a recommended uh, set of uh, sampling guidelines to ensure that whatever control measures are put in place um, are doing to make the difference in lowering the uh, exposure limits. So why is silica such a big deal? Well, it's 
believed to have lead to a potential of a, a variety of different diseases. Uh, most of them are related to the pulmonary uh, diseases, including silicosis, uh, lung cancer, bronchitis, COPD. Uh, but in addition to uh, pulmonary, you can actually have uh, other uh, diseases, including kidney disease, uh, as well as skin issues. Silica can be kind of a challenge to uh, enforce as far as getting people to do the right thing, uh, especially if it's a fairly short process. But over time, uh, if people don't actually Im implement the proper protections, they can lead to uh, some long-term health issues. Uh, in the short term, they could experience shortness of breath during exercise, but prolonged exposures can lead to, uh, to again, shortness of breath, chest pains, respiratory failure and even death. Um, in some uh, uh, rare cases, you might have acute silicosis develop uh, for after uh, short periods of high exposure. But for the most part, uh, this is more of a long-term uh, health implications leading to chronic silicosis, uh, uh, potentially over a uh, person's career. When it comes to uh, respirable dust uh, uh, analysis, size does matter. Uh, we're primarily worried about the respirable dust fraction. So when we're talking about respirable dust, what do we mean by that? Typically, anything that's under 100 micrometers in size can be inhaled, basically coat the mouth, the back of the throat, make it into the uh, upper sections of the uh, lung systems. But as the particulate matter gets smaller, uh, below 10 micrograms and, and more specifically four micrometers, which is what's considered the respirable dust, that gets deeper into the lung tissues and could uh, be, uh, make it difficult for the lung systems to expel that over time. To kind of give you a perspective of how small four micrometers is uh, with respect to a, a particle size, uh, I borrowed a graphic here uh, that shows a, a grain of sand on the left here. It's approximately about 90 micrometers in, in size or diameter. Uh, the average human hair could be assumed to be about 70 micrometers in diameter. If you look at one of these smaller spheres, this represents uh, 10 micrometers in size. And then uh, zooming in on one of these spheres and put some additional spheres, this is roughly two and a half micrometers in diameter. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a scale or challenge that we're left with uh, trying to isolate uh, from a uh, sampling standpoint. Luckily, over the last 40 years, we've had uh, different technologies emerge uh, for capturing the restful dust. Uh, most of the uh, early uh, technologies adopted what's called as cyclones. There's three different uh, families I'll be going over. Uh, the primary ones still used today are the cyclones. Our laboratory tends to carry the uh, uh, nylon SKCGS3 cyclone systems, uh, but there are a variety of different manufacturers, but they all work on the same principle in which uh, gravity and airflow into these units uh, helps uh, initiate the separation of the uh, respirable dust from all the heavier particulate matter. The way that these particular units uh, work is uh, basically the cassette gets uh, plugged into the top here. Uh, and then you have what's called the grid pod. And I just want to take a moment to kind of uh, make sure everybody understands that if you're new to using the cyclone systems and you're hooking these up to a pump, this little uh, cap at the end is considered uh, called the grid pod, needs to remain in place during sampling. Uh, some folks might think that they'd have to remove that plug and let the airflow come in through these, this bottom channel. In actuality, the air actually has to come in through these two little slits on the side here. Um, as the air enters the uh, chamber here, it basically sets up a cyclonic effect. Um, as long as these, th these units are in a vertical position, it uses gravity to pull the heavier particulate matter down, while the restful dust makes its way into the cassette itself. When you're done with the sampling, you simply disconnect the cassette from the cyclone unit, cap up the cassette, and submit the samples in for analysis. There are advantages to uh, these particular units. Uh, uh, they're rel relative to the other technologies I'm about to show you. They're they're fairly inexpensive. So as far as an initial investment, they run anywhere from 80 to 130 dollars per unit. Um, you, they use commercially available uh, tarred filters, and most of these tarred filters have a uh, see-through acrylic uh, body, which makes it ideal when you're trying to make sure you're not overloading your filters. You could peek in there and see if you're getting any uh, appreciable ac accumulation of dust. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, uh, it comes with a variety of sampling uh, rates, anywhere from uh, one and a half liters per minute to as much as two and almost three liter per minute flow rates. Uh, they also tend to hold together pretty well. 
the disadvantage of the un units is uh, they tend to be a little bit cumbersome when uh, you put it on an individual. Uh, by the time you get the cassette, the, the uh, cyclone system all set up, it's about a, a eight inch long uh, unit to wear uh, on the front. Uh, the other thing is we have to, they do work on the principle of the heavier particulates being pulled down by gravity. So the individual has to keep these in a vertical uh, position. Uh, the last thing is when you're retrieving these uh, units, uh, getting the cassettes from that, you want to be careful about not inadvertently tipping over the cyclone system and dumping your grid pot into the uh, cassette, basically negating your analysis. The second class of units is more of filtration. Uh, SKC put out uh, the IOM samplers. And the way these work is they actually have a uh, porous polyurethane uh, foam plug in the front. So the dust travels through that foam plug and makes its way over to the small little filter there. Uh, the laboratory sees these filter disks for the analysis. Uh, with these units, you can actually get two pieces of information. They offer the ability to collect both the inhalable and the respirable dust fractions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the advantage of these particular units is uh, you can get two pieces of information. Uh, unlike the cyclone systems where you have to remain verticals, the orientation of the individual does not uh, affect the um, uh, collection efficiencies of these units. Um, aside from crystal and silica, you don't really have to, you can actually apply these to um, other methodologies, including bioaerosol sampling, as well as metals analysis. Uh, this little unit on the right here is basically what the laboratory actually ends up receiving uh, for the analysis. You don't have to send the entire holder. You just basically take this little magazine out and uh, send that back to the laboratory. Uh, the disadvantages include uh, they tend to be a little bit more expensive. There's some uh, long-term hidden costs associated with uh, maintaining these samplers, including having to not only buy the uh, filters, but also buy the foam plugs to, to uh, fraction out the restable fraction. Um, it, since they're an opaque uh, unit, it's hard to kind of get a measure of whether you're potentially overloading those uh, units. So you could potentially uh, uh, overload your samples. The third class of uh, samplers that uh, basically come on the market over the last four to five years are the inertial impactor samplers, or uh, SKC puts out the uh, parallel particle impactors in uh, two different flavors. Uh, there's a reusable unit that can uh, be purchased at a two to eight liter per minute flow rate. Uh, well, if you don't want to invest in the a reusable unit, they actually have uh, the disposable units as well, also in the same range of flow rates between two to eight liters per minute. The way that these particular units work is they actually have four different size holes that uh, regulate the uh, particle intake and uh, help uh, eliminate some of the uh, particle sizes. There's a middle stage here that actually has four little grease plates that basically trap some of the uh, heavier particulate matter while allowing the uh, respirable fraction to go through another series of four holes before eventually depositing on the final filter. Analytically, uh, this is basically all the laboratory is looking to get. If you're using the reusable unit, you can either send the entire unit to us or you can uh, try to extract this filter, put it in an appropriate uh, holder system, and send that to the laboratory. Um, the advantage of these particular units is uh, they do come in uh, some of the highest flow rates available, including the eight liters per minute. That could be advantageous if you're in a situation where you're limited in time and you wanna try to get as much airflow or air collection uh, to make sure you're able to uh, get a decent representative sample. Uh, similar to the IOM samplers, the orientation of the personnel is not, does not affect the uh, function of the unit. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they come in two flavors. The disposable, disposable units tend to make it a uh, little bit convenient uh, for the field personnel to just unplug it and send the entire unit to the laboratory for analysis. Uh, the disadvantages, they tend to be a little bit pricier, uh, especially the reusable units. They run as much as $600 a piece, uh, depending on the uh, make and model. Uh, there also is some additional cost. If you buy the, the uh, reusable units, you have to basically uh, replace the grease plates uh, with each sampling time and put in a fresh filter, obviously. Uh, the other thing is uh, you want to be careful about coordinating uh, your filters. Uh, going back to laboratory, if you're planning on doing both a respirable dust and silica, you want to make sure that uh, you keep track of the original uh, serial numbers assigned by the laboratories to, so they can track back the original tear value on those. Uh, they're similar to the IOM sampler. It's difficult to see uh, whether you're potentially overloading these particular units as well. 
regardless of which uh, particular unit you use, they're all going to have to basically uh, generate the same collection profile as shown on this graphic here. Anytime you hear somebody talk about a 50% cut point, what they're referring to is um, if these units are properly deployed, about 50% of the four micrometers in diameter size particulate uh, will make it onto the, the uh, filter itself, while the other 50% uh, may uh, not make it all the way in. But as the particulate matter gets smaller, the collection efficiency goes way up. So it's important that whatever unit you decide to use, you use the uh, recommended flow rates for that particular unit. If you decide to play around with the flow, rate, flow rates increasing or decreasing, you're basically just shifting this line back and forth and affecting the uh, collection dynamics of those units. Media is very important. If you're going to take anything away from today's talk is uh, when you're dealing with crystal and silica, it's important that you collect on a polyvinyl chloride or PVC filter. Uh, this will give you the best results quantitatively and qualitatively as well. Um, if you're dealing with the cyclone systems, uh, there's typically two types of uh, filter cassettes you might order from uh, your preferred vendor. Uh, the first one would be a three-piece cassette, which actually has three segments to it. The way that these work for a lot of the aluminum cyclones and the uh, nylon cyclones is you're literally removing this top section so that you expose this metal rib and then this uh, aluminum or uh, cyclone slides into this metal rib. One thing I recommend having if you're planning on using these type of units is as part of your uh, uh, case, have a, uh, a little bit of Vaseline. Uh, these units can benefit with a very, very light coating of uh, Vaseline on these this gaskets. It serves a couple of purposes. It makes it easier to uh, get, it, get it onto the cassette and back off the cassette. It provides a better seal and it keeps that little rubber gasket from uh, uh, eventually drying out. There are some units uh, that uh, can use the uh, two-piece cassette version. Uh, and the nice thing about those particular units is all rather than having to remove the entire end cap here, you can remove the red and blue caps and just clamp it in the, into the unit itself. Under the current OSHA, unlike the previous uh, recommendations for the restable dust, uh, the current OSHA regulations does not necessarily require you to do both the restable dust and silica. However, from a laboratory standpoint, we still recommend uh, that you can consider adding restable dust analysis to your silica analysis. Uh, mainly for two reasons. Uh, even if your samples come back non-detected for uh, crystal and silica, you still have a restable dust uh, data that you can uh, make sure that uh, you're not exceeding any recommended uh, PELs for that. The second reason is more of insurance. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a possibility with some of these units to overload them and not be able to see that and, and make that assessment during the course of the sampling. Um, if you were to overload a filter, basically anything that's got more than two milligrams worth of material accumulated on there, uh, the laboratory basically has to treat it as a bulk sample. And then what that means is we will literally crack this uh, cassette open and uh, scrape off a couple of milligrams of the dust, loose particulate matter. The problem with that is uh, in the end, we end up reporting in terms of percent silica content. And you can't take that percent and directly compare it to the uh, current OSHA regulations, which are in micrograms per cubic meter. However, if you did get a restable dust analysis on that, you could take that percent value, multiply it against the restable dust value, and estimate what kind of uh, the microgram per cubic meter values for the uh, silica. I'll show you a, a report here in, in just a second. Kind of shows that example. Um, when doing, when setting in your filters for analysis, there's a variety of acceptable uh, silica methods out there that include X-ray diffraction, IR. Our laboratory primarily tends to run the NOSH, but it's 7500 and or the OSHA ID 142 method. Uh, the 7500 allows us to do the uh, all three polymorphs, quartz, chrysobolite, and tritomite. Um, OSHA ID 145 was actually developed for quartz and cristobalite. The reason they didn't include the tritomite on that uh, was in order for them to stay in compliance with their uh, recommended OSHA guidelines under Appendix A. Uh, they have to use a NIST certified uh, standard for tritomite. Unfortunately, there we don't have that opportunity or option to get a NIST certified uh, tritomite. So most laboratories are using a geological standard to use as a reference standard. Uh, so regardless, uh, both 7500 and the OSHA ID 142 are probably the most popular methods that most laboratories will run nationwide. Uh, the second thing you want to make sure is that your uh, laboratory is AIHA accredited specifically for the methods for, uh, that they intend to use for silica analysis. 
Um, if you have any questions about that, just ask two questions. Are you AIHA accredited for the uh, methodology and are you in compliant with the OSHA Appendix A? Uh, if they're up to guides, if they're up to speed as far as what that means, they'll know right away. In fact, uh, Salt Lake City has been doing this for over 40 years. And one thing that we're take pride on is not only do we meet the guidelines uh, currently uh, recommended by the Appendix A, but we typically exceed most of the guidelines. Just uh, before I conclude here, I want to give you kind of an example of what a laboratory uh, report might look like. Um, in this particular uh, report, we actually give two pieces of information. We give the restable dust and the different uh, polymorphs. Uh, typically, a uh, laboratory report will include both uh, milligrams per sample, that's the total amount of uh, found on the filters themselves, and then we take into account the air volume and calculate the uh, air uh, concentrations. This uh, report kind of gives you a uh, uh, view of what would happen if you overload a filter and we had to report in terms of uh, percent silica. As you see here, we can only give you the percent. You don't have the air concentrations. But again, if you happen to get the restable dust analysis done on that filter, uh, you can take this percent value, multiply it against this restable dust value, and basically get an estimation of your uh, silica content. This is kind of an example of what you might expect to see visually if you're approaching an overloaded filter. Uh, if you see any of this loose particulate matter, then it's maybe time to either consider uh, cutting the sampling short or uh, switching out a fresh cassette. Covered a lot of ground today, talked a little bit about the chemistry, the uh, uh, guidelines, and a lot of technologies available for capturing the restful dust. I uh, appreciate your time. I'd be willing to take any uh, questions or comments at this time. Thank you, Paul. Yes, we will go ahead and open it up for questions. If you would like to ask a question to Paul directly, feel free to use the raise your hand feature and I can go ahead and unmute you. Or you can actually type in your question in the ask a question box or the chat box. So we'll go ahead and give a few moments. It looks like we do have some questions already coming in. From Alan, Paul, he says, uh, recommend bulk samples to categorize for potential silica hazards say of mortar, also the recommended samples for settled dusts for silica types? Uh, you can submit the bulk samples then, although it's not necessarily, in the end, it, it matters of what's actually getting airborne. And uh, right now, the OSHA guidelines have pushed the laboratories to see down extremely low for crystalline silica. So I think the uh, submitting a bulk sample would be a, a bit of overkill with respect to what we're able to offer now. Thank you. We don't have any additional questions right now, but we will still stay open for a couple more, more minutes since it normally does take some people some time. Um, I do want to let everyone know that we do record these webinars and you will be sent an email the following week um, with a link to access this recorded webinar today. We do have a few additional questions coming in. We have one from Chris. He says, where would someone get the testing equipment? Um, a lot of laboratories, I know our laboratory can provide both the um, uh, the media itself, we do carry uh, the PPI samplers, the IOM samplers, as well as some of the uh, cyclone models, primarily the uh, GS3 and the aluminum. Uh, but if you're looking to get it from a third party other than a laboratory, then folks like uh, SKC West, uh, Zephon International, there's a variety of vendors out there where you can actually purchase the uh, uh, the samplers themselves as well as the equipment. Most laboratories now offer some type of uh, equipment rental as well. Thank you. We have another one coming in. Does ALS show a value for total crystalline silica on the results? We do. The final report does include a uh, not only the individual polymorphs, but an overall value. OK. Also, which sampler would be best for a person who is working around drilling through concrete? You know, any one of these units would work. Uh, I have a personal preference for the cyclone systems and the uh, PPI samplers. Okay, we have another one from David. He asks, what kind of interferences do you see and how do you manage? Uh, there is a potential to get some interferences from uh, some clay materials. Uh, from an XRD standpoint, we basically uh, 
uh, either dilute the sample or uh, take additional readings to minimize some of those interferences. Um, another one from Don. He says, don't forget the calibration cowl for the PPI. Not quite sure that was a question. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very good point. Even though these units, um, uh, when you purchase one of these units, make sure you get some way of calibrating, especially with the cyclones, the PPI samplers. Um, a little trick that you can use in the field if you find yourself that you forgot your uh, adapters, your calibration jar, et cetera, you can potentially hook up the uh, filter and the, uh, the unit before your calibration unit, whether you're using a dry cal or field rotometer, and then connect the pump to the outlet side of that unit so that the air travels through your calibration, your uh, uh, PPI sampler or cyclone system, the calibration unit, and then the pump. Then when once you get everything dialed into the appropriate uh, flow rate, you can reconnect that uh, unit directly to the pump and off your uh, go. Perfect. We have a, um, a raised hand from Rob. Rob, I will go ahead and unmute you. You can go ahead and ask your question. Rob, did you want to go ahead and ask your question? Maybe he did not want to ask it. He did write in a question, so we can go back to his question. Um, Rob says, how many degrees out of plum, out of plum, can a cyclone sampling train be and still not jeopardize the sample collection? I would go beyond 45 degrees. Perfect. Janine asks, do you have a video showing a tutorial on setting up each sampler? Uh, we do have one available on YouTube uh, that ALS put out for the uh, GS3 cyclones as well as the aluminum, but uh, we have not uh, developed one for the either the IOM samplers or the PPI samplers. However, if you are interested, feel free to drop me a quick email and I'd be happy to send you a uh, PowerPoint presentation that kind of outlines uh, that using pictures uh, for each one of those units. Um, we also have, how many blanks do you recommend sending with the samples? Um, we typically recommend sending, uh, following the 10% rule for every 10 samples you submit, uh, include at least one field blank. Um, if you look at the NIOSH recommendations, they typically uh, uh, ask for anywhere, anywhere from two to three uh, field blanks, but uh, uh, for most applications, one field blank for at least every 10 samples should be uh, enough. We have another question from Melissa. She asks, what is the longest sampling duration you have seen for these samples? For example, ambient samples for community monitoring. I can't say that I've seen anything beyond 12 hours. Um, most of the pumps that these things operate on uh, have a charge, especially if you're running at uh, two to three liter per minute flow rates. Those pumps uh, sitting on a charge will only go up to about 12 hour time frame before it dies off. So I'm not familiar with any, um, uh, say, ambient uh, fence line monitoring type setups for this type of analysis. That looks like the last question. We don't have any follow-up questions to all your answers, so thank you, Paul. I do want to let every, remind everyone, because we did get a few questions, we do record this webinar and we do send it out to all the attendees today, as well as post it onto our ALS YouTube page as well as our ALS website. So you can feel free to visit this presentation as well as our other past webinar Wednesday presentations as well. And I don't see any additional questions coming in. Um, again, on the email that we do send out does include Paul's Paul Pope's contact information. So if you ha do have any follow-up questions, you feel free to email him at that time. You can also reach him. His email is paul.pope at alsglobal.com. I want to thank you again, Paul, for this presentation today, and thank you all for attending. We'll see you next time. All right. Thank you all.